Welcome to the Amazon Legends Podcast, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became powerful sellers, also experts specializing in helping sellers, and both former and current Amazon employees who will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here's your host, Nick Urison. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. And today I have a guest who's been at it for the past four years, building his brands. Uh, his name is Robert, Robert Gomez. Robert is the founder of 4Q Brands. And um, he holds a, a Georgia Tech MBA, uh, pretty knowledgeable, and a senior position with Microsoft. So, um, so this guy knows what he's doing when it comes to dealing with technology related stuff. And um, so his, uh, his company, 4Q Brands, has been in business for four years. And um, he, he has two brands currently. And one of them is Cafe. And Cafe is uh, about coffee products and accessories. He has another brand, totally unrelated, called Bullet Keeper. And it's about brand uh, building this brand in notebooks and planning products. So you can kind of see the, 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 the fingerprints of uh, someone who's intensely working on stuff constantly planning, organizing while drinking heavy coffee. So he, <laughs> he ended up building brands around it. So when uh, we first met and we were talking about his, you know, how he went about doing this, uh, he said something very different than most my guests uh, brought up so far. And he, he started something about a year, year and a half ago, which has nothing to do with sales or advertising or anything like that and that ended, ended up impacting his entire business so so robert tell us about what that was yeah first off and, and thanks for having me nick um so about a year and a half two years ago uh on the on this journey you know that we've been on uh we've been on amazon now for for over four years but uh, about uh, as mentioned about a year and a half two years ago we started really working on the on the processes, uh, you know, on the company and streamlining kind of the operations and our infrastructure internally. And uh, obviously that, that took a while and a lot of optimizing over time, but, but it's really starting to pay off, uh, especially as of late, you know, that strategy to deleverage a little bit from Amazon and start uh, selling on, on a lot of other channels. And, and those are things that we've been now able to scale because of that early on work that we did um, beforehand. What, what prompted that? What, why a year and a half? I mean, you obviously you had been doing it for two years prior to that. You obviously were generating sales. And what was the event that brought that about? Yeah, so, you know, to, to backtrack a, a little bit, I started my journey on Amazon with the Bullet Keeper brand. It's a brand of office products uh, planners. Uh, it was something that I liked uh, using in my personal life. And so when trying to get into the whole e-commerce and Amazon, I was looking for a product that was light uh, and sort of able to, to bring to market. Um, and so that, that was for about a year, year and a half. And so um, after a little while, I, I decided to get more into uh, the home and kitchen space. And so that was bringing about the cafe brand. Um, and so it was right around that time that I thought, you know, we, we better focus on our infrastructure, you know, as we're adding another brand, not only that, but, you know, the amount of SKUs uh, and our strategy was to, to kind of spread, you know, past just Amazon. So uh, me having the, the software background and, and I have a, a finance, you know, the, the uh, background. So from early on, I, I wanted to treat this whole journey as, uh, as if we were a much bigger company. Uh, or, or at least striving to be. So early on, work was, uh, you know, is detrimental to the success we can see now. So this was a deliberate attempt. There was no like crisis you experienced. Uh, it was simply you had a triggering event that that had happened, which is adding another brand. And at that point, you said, no, I'm not going to focus on sales, 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 but look at infrastructure, right? Yeah, I think, you know, it probably came around, you know, when we started trying to sell on even one other channel, right? And so, like, once you start 
something that small even, uh, you realize, oh, how am I going to track the sales? How am I going to track, you know, the inventory? How am I going to kind of bring it, tie it all together? Um, because Amazon is not providing these services on these other channels. And so from early on, you you kind of start chipping away at all the, the software and, and tools that you need um, to be able to scale to a certain level. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to find out something because this, this often comes up and some of my clients bring it up. And whenever I meet people, it's like the first thing that comes to their mind. If you are building multiple brands, so did you choose to create a separate seller account or did you bring that into your existing seller account as an additional brand? Yeah, the way we did it, and I've seen it done both ways, uh, we did it under one seller account. Um, I, I can see the the justification for keeping it under two seller accounts. And, and, and if you're able to, by all means, I would say probably best to, to do it that way to keep it cleaner. Uh, the reason we did it under one seller account was, uh, you know, because it's all under one umbrella company, 4Q Brands, uh, first off. But, but second, you know, there, there is, or at least there was risk back, you know, years back. There was like talks, you know, on forums and things like that, that if you tried to open a second account, even if you had a legitimate reason, you know, there was all these things about risking your account being suspended and all that, you know, the usual Amazon yeah, kind of risk. So you know, we we never even took a chance. Um, but for us, it's worked out just great because you know everything's feeding from one account. So uh, it's, it's yeah, consolidated. Yeah, I mean, you're right. This situation with Amazon mandating how many accounts we can. It's, uh, I, I've had situations where we actually opened. First of all, about a year or so ago, maybe they didn't allow multiple accounts. Period without prior approval and then you know they would want to be consulted first if you wanted a separate account find out the reasons and then finally i i had situations where i arranged an invite to be sent to the customer but uh, these days it's easier but it's still first of all operating two companies versus one company you know you're doubling the work right you have separate set of books especially when it comes to if you're selling mul through multiple channels, two sets of sales tax accounting, and it can get complicated. So I think, I think yours was the cleanest solution. Plus, if you're building an entity with multiple brands, it makes sense from strategy standpoint, right? Yeah, it does. Uh, I think that the one thing to point out there is now with the more and more uh, growing number of acquisitions and, and aggregators in the space. The only thing is, if you're trying to unload on one of the brands, uh, it probably is a much cleaner transaction if you have it separately to begin with. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but otherwise, of course, uh, they, they do look at, you know, all the whole accounts, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, that was going to be my question. So if you build multiple accounts on uh, multiple brands on Amazon, and you happen to sell one or two of them, how would you go about, do you know how you would separate that on Amazon and then actually let somebody else take over? Yeah, so uh, obviously if you want to actually keep, uh, more than likely you would have to create a new seller account and, and the, the brand that you are keeping um transfer those SKUs there so like essentially create those offers on the new brand and get permission from whoever you sold your account to to be able to sell the you know that brand and ultimately transfer maybe the trademark or, or the the brand registry admin rights yeah um but otherwise you you would have to transfer you know the whole account uh if, if you are selling yeah. the brand because i see uh, i mean you are in also finance you may already know that familiar with how it plays out but a lot of uh, private equity firms you will venture capital firms they are either acquiring uh, or funding or in fact building their own brands on amazon with their own funds right that's happening right now yeah i would say a lot more acquiring than building their own brands uh you know because uh, Easier, right if, if you've been in the space you know it's it's a lot it, it's hard to start from scratch. You know, the, the more that time has gone by on the Amazon and Amazon has matured and become a lot more professional now with these uh, 
Amazon aggregators in the space as well. It's a lot harder to start off than than you know maybe it used to be in the yeah. So um, okay, I mean this is very smart. Uh, you know, building infrastructure because without the infrastructure, you can't really scale it. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you you'll get bogged down with so many things. Yeah, not just that, but like you know the transparency you have into what how much money you're actually making. You know, a lot of people talk about this, and and me having come from from a finance background, I wanted to find out from as early on as possible, how much money was I actually making, right? So there's obviously you can, uh, you know, hook it up to QuickBooks and all this, but if you don't really know, you know, don't have a, the true accounting in place, uh, you don't know what your true, you know, uh, moving average costs, landed costs are, are you know, posting in the, the different P&L buckets, um, all that ties to, you know, having the right system in place so that every time you make a sale, it, it's automated, right? It posts the, the, accounting transactions it, 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 you can you're able to report on it you, you're able to see sales by customer by you know channel by uh, skew you know the trend so a lot of that is key you know no matter how early on you are in, in the journey uh, I would say I would advocate to do it you know as early as possible because the earlier you do it it's also the easier to do it right so you don't want um. to wait until you're kind of in a tangled mess or, or being asked by an aggregator uh, if you're trying to exit to to then put together your financials, right? Because then at that point, you don't even know if you have made them, you know, how much money you've made or, you know, yeah. your actual like profit. And that's what they're, they're base, basing their, you know, um, appraisals or valuations on. So you need, you know, to, to have all that information. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is a very, uh, fine point. I say mainly because people don't think about it. Uh, my biggest, well, I should say not biggest, but my the most common dysfunction that I see with companies that uh, are, are already up and running on Amazon, they've been generating orders, they have no inventory management system. So what happens as a result, that brings about two serious challenges because first of all, if you don't have a true inventory management system, what that means is, to me at least, I want to know how many pieces are in stock in multiple locations. That doesn't mean you have to be a big operation. The minute that you have FBA inventory, you are multiple locations, right? So yeah. you need to know real time how much you have in stock in the warehouse, whether it's 3PL or your own, or and Amazon. And then what is the total value of it? And that is not enough, but it's essential to know what your net liquidity is. In other words, how much profit you are building after all your expenses, how much money you're making, leaving cash in the pocket compared to how much you're carrying in inventory. So yeah, that's right. That, that comparison is key. So you know, the example I came up with is, like, let's say, let's say you have healthy margins, you know, where you have really healthy, like 20 plus percent net, net, net profit, which is very hard to achieve. But let's say that you're achieving it. But what is that in dollar value? Let's say $10,000 or $50,000. Doesn't matter. Let's say, just make it more attractive, $50,000 every month, you're pocketing. But if you are holding... $250,000 worth of inventory at any point in time, that means you need to work five months just to cover the value of the inventory. And it's not possible, right? Because you are also growing at the same time. So, but in order to know this, you really need to have systems because your inventory is constantly changing. You're selling, you're buying new ones coming in, right? Yeah. This is, this is so, so this is challenge number one. Challenge number two is, when you were so right when you said you have to do it early because it's easier. Let's say at some point you say, no, I'm going to switch to this. I need to know this. Well, what will be your opening balances? Good luck figuring out what you are holding at Amazon, right? You never yeah. know. There's no. It download. may be too late. You know, it may be too late by then. You find out that you're not making as much profit as you thought on your right. product. And, and there's no going back up on the price because the, uh, category may not bear it and and by that point you know it's too late so yeah yeah so the earlier the better 
this is this is so key and uh, getting the financials and the systems uh, in place. So yeah, let's uh, let's uh, talk about a little bit of a, a big picture, thirty thousand uh, foot view of what what do you see as the biggest opportunity on Amazon? Why should somebody be on Amazon, and what could they achieve by by being there? And what are the challenges that come with it? Yeah, so of course, you know, Amazon is Amazon, right? And, and so the whole Amazon itself and e-commerce overall is the opportunity, right? Uh, you see something that, um, you know, allows you to scale up, uh, you know, the, that, the dream that they kind of sell, right? It is true. It's a cliche for a reason, right? You're able to sell from anywhere. You're able to start off, um, you know, pretty small and then, you know, scale up using their infrastructure. So that's, really like an opportunity that you wouldn't have otherwise, right? Selling in a local brick and mortar, you're only selling to those customers that are around that area, right? And so, um, you know, selling on Amazon allows you to kind of build up that online presence. And, and also, you know, once you get to, to a more serious level, uh, Amazon does provide a level of volume that you may not find in just any other channel, if at all, right? So, um, you know, building up that, that volume of units helps your business in a lot of ways, right? Obviously not just make profit ideally, but also with your factories, right? You're building more volume. There's more of a relationship there. And overall, you know, that 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 is an opportunity, right? Within yeah. Amazon. And it does come with a lot of challenges, right? And, and yeah. you know, uh, more and more, I would say uh, as time goes on, and as I mentioned, you know, a little bit ago, the space has become more professional right so it, you really do need to know your stuff uh, if you're coming into space and have some amount of that capital you know like a, a good amount of capital to really be able to make an impact and so mm -hmm. you know those are opportunities and challenges but but uh in my opinion you know the, it's still early on in the in the whole e-commerce uh amazon journey for for consumers overall right you see it uh, it's still, you know, uh, e-commerce is a lot smaller than physical retail sales overall in the U S right. And, and thankfully with, uh, uh, COVID not thankful for COVID, but thankfully, uh, during COVID that accelerated the, the e-commerce growth, maybe I think analysts said like 10 years worth of growth, uh, because of that. And, and so, you know, we're still benefiting anyone in the space, or at least, uh, there is potential to benefit from it. Yeah. Well, so what do you say to somebody? I mean, I know you are doing direct building your brand, selling direct to consumer, but uh, those traditionally, you know how it is. If you were building your brand, you would get a supply chain, you would establish your distributors, your wholesale relationships, and you didn't bother with this direct to consumer thing. So uh, there are many companies I think these days, more and more of the brands that are getting started, they, they have Amazon in mind. And so they are the only sellers. But traditionally speaking, those who have many brands that, that they own and they have a supply chain, why should they be on Amazon? Or should they be on Amazon? And if so, why? And why can't they just keep going the way they are? Or somebody even starting new, the the immediate tendency for them is i'm just gonna go get some big get into some big box retailers and get some shelf space and then sell it and then you know that way you can deal with mass mass vo volume so uh, what's wrong with that approach why can't they just stick to that you know uh, i think that was also uh, our strategy over time is to tackle some of those things like when i said lead be leveraging from amazon you know we tried you know going into retail and going into other channels and maybe not leveraging amazon as much um, but at the end of the day you know even big brands you know you see some big brands not wanting to sell on amazon because they do on their own but ultimately uh they realize the amount of uh you know money they're leaving on the table by not selling on amazon right if they don't do it some uh, someone else will uh, and not just someone else will, but someone else will control the narrative for that brand. So when you're a brand owner on Amazon, you control your narrative, right? You're in control of the brand. And so you're able to put up a good, you know, front there. Um, but the other channels, you know, speaking to like physical retail, for example, we've had some uh, success on and off, like, for example, with, with Home Goods, you know, TJ Maxx company, we, we've gone into retail there. 
And we've tried, we've had talks with many other buyers from, you know, like big box retailers. But what you're seeing, especially after COVID, was that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be really tough to get into a physical retailer without first having to have proved yourself on their e, uh, .com website or a .com marketplace, right? So it used to be that, you know, you, you could kind of talk your way or if you had a connection, you may be able to get into like a big box retailer or obviously if you're a big name, uh, like a hot new product, you may still be able to pull that off, right? But uh, if you're just a product that, you know, good product and you, you have the capabilities to be in big box, you're more than likely going to going to be asked to to prove yourself on online first before they take a risk on you uh, on on physical retail, right? Because if you think of physical retail, there's no uh, it's not an infinite amount of retail space like there is on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to get your product on Target, um, their shelves are typically maybe not now with supply chain issues, but their shelves are full, right? So for your product to be in there, a product has to come out right mm -hmm. and so why would they choose that you know why would they choose you right and, and so you know if you've proven yourself on their marketplace online then maybe you have more of a of a you know leverage there in the conversation saying hey you know we can do this uh you know maybe we can give it a shot on, on big box yeah but yeah i mean also you know don't forget this is a big deal to me that's the most practical aspect of it is uh, if you sell to these big box retailers, <coughs> first of all, you, you're selling wholesale. So you're getting half the revenue. In addition, you have to give them terms, like 90 days plus. And if you're lucky, you get paid in 90 days. I mean, well, it, it, so if, if you really just from financial standpoint, why do I have to wait for 90 days to get half of what I can get, right? So I mean, that's the yeah. it is give and take. Yeah. yeah, but of course you get volume, but you know they also have you have to service these big box retailers. So and Amazon has really disrupted the space in terms of the consumer expectation of best customer experience. I mean, who can provide a better customer experience than the brand owner, right? Resellers don't care; they just issue the refund and then they're done. Uh, and if they're not making enough money. So when somebody asks me this question, there's several, I mean, you've given the answers. I say to them, look, first of all, if you sell through a supply chain, your product will end up in the hands of resellers, period. And if you're not on Amazon, they're going to sell on Amazon. You're not representing yourself on Amazon. So anybody and Amazon system will let them be the authority on the listing. And the next thing is the price gets driven down to the bottom. Your brand gets tarnished and there's nothing you can do about it. So um, why, why, why allow that? Instead, get on Amazon and, and make the sale, get paid every other week. You just need to do the work. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, it's best to keep an omni-channel strategy, uh, you know, starting with Amazon, I would say, and control your retail pricing, uh, you know, because if you control that, then you know that you have margins to go to big box as well if you needed to, right? Yeah. Um, one thing to point out uh, with big box or anytime you're dealing with other channels where it's more of a vendor relationship like that, um, you may be able, I mean, you may be getting about half the 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 price you usually get from amazon or, or something like that maybe even less but uh there are no ad costs there are no commission fees and uh, you know there's a lot of yes. things that you also don't have so uh it's just good to consider but you know it doesn't rule one out over the other because one's paying you less um but certainly you need the amazon presence to be able to control your your narrative and i it's something to point out as well that, that you briefly touched on is the supply chain and the terms that you're getting you know if at any point you really want to scale your your business to any sort of level. Um, you're gonna need to think about you know supplier terms or how to really uh, best kind of grow in that sense because you're gonna need capital or, or constantly feel like you're needing capital, right? Especially in the period peak periods. And so that was one key thing, you know, just speaking from experience. One key thing that that. Uh, I worked on really closely with my supplier as soon as COVID hit. So when COVID hit, you know, uh, obviously sales kind of went through the roof a little bit. And so we were facing 
these issues of, of inventory already from early on. And, and so that's because we, we had the traditional terms you get, you know, when you go to a supplier, like 30% deposit and 70% payment before the product arrived to the U S right. And yeah. so what does that do? If you have a product that, you know, you're selling, you know, hundreds or, or whatever units amounts per day. Uh, and it's a product that, that costs, you know, uh, eight to $12, uh, or something per, per unit. Uh, you're talking about, you need, you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, half a million plus in inventory for that single product, just in case, you know, you get a bestseller badge or, or you kind of sales pick up or the holiday. And so, you know, when you're running a small operation and, and you're trying to scale to that level, uh, you, you don't want to be personal or you will be personally liable, but you need some, some terms kind of to, to be able to help you scale. So when COVID hit, that, that was something I negotiated with my supplier. Um, so we, we went from paying 30% uh, deposit and 70%, you know, before I arrived to then paying uh, 15% deposit. And we didn't pay the remaining 85% until 60 to 90 days after the product got to the U.S. So what that allowed us to do was then, you know, sell to like home goods, which we had 60 day terms, essentially sell to them without having to put our own money. And then, you know, we, we order a lot more in inventory, finally able to catch up on the inventory side, um, you know, essentially selling it before we paid our suppliers, or at least that was the idea. Maybe it overlapped a little bit, but it, it helped uh, ease the, the capital uh, requirements and, and, you know, scale a bit. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is very smart. <clears throat> I, I say this uh, always. I mean, that's why I was talking about earlier you know, you need to know what your liquidity is and you need to know what kind of inventory you are carrying in terms of dollar value. And those two are the most important things you need to be watching. And what you just explained is that that's the reason why, because if the sales go up, you need to keep ordering and based on your terms with your supplier, you need to, you need to be able to finance it. Otherwise, you won't be able to maintain the, the sales. So, uh, and the cheapest credit, or I should say the cheapest money that you can find is the credit you're going to get from your supplier, right? Does it yeah. cost you anything? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, if you I, think about that situation, yeah, they, they're personally uh, lending me, you know, uh, at some point in time, more than, you know, $500,000, 800000 in, in inventory where who, what other bank would have given you that money, you know, without being, you know, proving yourself for many, many exactly. years to be much I mean, larger. I had, I had a situation like that. I was growing. Uh, so I, I did the, when, when my growth started my first year, I had like one and a half million. And then the second year it went to three and a half. And I know in year three, I'm going to exceed 10 million. So, uh, cause it usually tripled. So here I know the, sh the shopping season is coming. And I was not, it wasn't my own brand. I, we were reselling, but that makes it even harder because you had to carry so many SKUs and other. So, and whoever you go to, they give you 30 days, but no longer. <clears throat> and if you want really sizable credit limit on your account, they have all this insurance lookup. And, and of course, the insurance company will approve you for so much. And that's another thing the credit that you get from your supplier may not be enough. They may need insurance coverage if suddenly you're doing more. And as a smaller company, a smaller operation, you're not going to get approved. So they're going to say you have to pay the rest cash. So all these things. So that year, uh, what I did, I opened a new account with 20 wholesalers. So I had a buyer and I said to her, you, you're going to Vegas and you are opening 20 new accounts. Because I knew every single one would give twenty thousand dollar credit limit easily, so uh, so so she did. That's four hundred thousand dollars credit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my strategy, and that that put me through. And of course, we started buying. We exhausted the limits with like at least half of them. So uh, I mean, that, that's what happens. And you, if you don't keep going. You're going to leave money on the table and then suddenly your performance drops. When the performance drops, everything else drops. So uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the, the model. So you are obviously selling your own items. Uh, 
what do you prefer, FBA, FBN? What are the pros, cons, and what? Yeah, how how are you doing it? Yeah. So to be honest, we've been FBA from the very beginning, um, and our strategy was to be FBA to be private label, uh, and and the the reason being. You know, FBA, we've always heard, you know, that's how you get the prime badge. Uh, Amazon favors you in the search results. Uh, we leverage Amazon's warehousing, you know, uh, a lot of pros with that, right? So FBM, obviously, you're sending your own goods uh, from, from wherever you have them stored. But in, in our minds, you know, FBA is, is kind of the way to go if you're selling on Amazon. Um, and the private label side, the reason being we always wanted to do private label was we had, you know, we wanted to control our brand, you know, from end to end. Um, we we didn't want to be in someone else's kind of control, so to speak, right? So there's pros and cons, of course, of wholesaling or drop shipping. Um, but we thought, you know, we want to really create a brand that, that we're that we're behind and and we can really see from from inception to you know going to market and seeing at the store. You know. Do you have? I mean, obviously, there's the FBA cost. I mean, you're right. You get the prime badge. The customer has two day shipping or even one day shipping at no yeah. cost to you, but you pay Amazon the fulfillment cost. And yeah. you being in finance intimately understanding the dynamics. What is the ideal price point for you to use FBA and also have ad campaigns running, paid ad campaigns running to make money on your Amazon? Because a lot of people, they want to sell cheap items and make on the volume. And so, but it doesn't always work because yeah. you know, of course. So what is an ideal price point of an item? You know, let's say it depends on the item as well. Uh, you know, we sell notebooks and, and we retail some of them for $20 and, and they're some of our highest margin SKUs because of, of course it's a very light item. It's very um, cheap to make, you know, compared to other things. And so it, it could work at the $20 range. But I would say the ideal uh, sweet spot is really, you know, in the $25 to $50 range, depending on your landed costs and your margins on that product, you know, for you to be able to run ads. And, and hopefully uh, what matters most is that you're in a competitive category and then you're near the top, right? So that that's, of course, uh, what has a lot to do with it. You don't want to just retail hire, just for retailing hire. You want to make sure you're still competitive. Uh, but what is, a, what is a good gross margin to shoot for when you are picking products? Uh, you know, people go back and forth on this. I, I would say I, I, I'll focus more on the, on the margin before kind of after ads, every, after everything Amazon takes. And, you know, the ideal would be, uh, you know, in the 25 to 30% range after the ads, you know, but, uh, you know, what you come to find out is sometimes you're, you're lower than that, you know, especially if you're doing volume or you find yourself competing, you know, and trying to run deals and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I would say focus on the landed cost being a small percentage of, of, you know, the overall sale. I would think that's a good starting point. How small? Like 20%? Like 20 would be great. You know, uh, you know, anywhere in the twenties would be, still good uh, but the lower the better yes yeah yeah i mean i have people come to me i, I have something that i use uh, to build the revenue that's the first thing i build the revenue model and i color coded the buckets uh, the top bucket is uh, the gross margin and that bucket in order to be in green has to be no more than 30 percent yeah. So they sometimes come to me with like 50%. They can say, oh, you know, I can buy a lot. And, and I say, okay, how much are you going to sell this for? Oh, we want to sell it really cheap. So you want to sell a lot. Okay, you're going to sell it for 30 bucks. How much are you going to buy it for? 20 bucks. No, don't bother. No. <laughs> yeah, you have to think of like what the best case scenario is as well, right? Or at least what a good case scenario is, right? That's what we're all in business is to have a, at least a good case scenario. And that way you made some money or something, right? So if yeah. you think about whichever product you're selling, I mean, say, ideally you want to be in a category that is seen as, you know, kind of mainstream, normal, kind of has some volume. Uh, but say you're buying a, a product, you know, like uh, think of like what would happen if you make it to the top five in your category, top three, top whatever, right? So you're going to be selling 
maybe you know hundreds of units a day maybe more than 100 whatever it is uh, if you're top five um try to map that out right you need a couple months worth of inventory if your product is twenty dollars and you need hundreds a day like where are you going to get a couple million dollars worth of you yeah. know like uh so it's like you're good case scenario like you go out of business either way so, so yeah. uh you really have to map that out uh you know some people try to focus on like categories that are not as uh competitive i guess and, and work out that way but yeah it's it's a balance of what what you're trying to achieve and and what you do so you being a numbers oriented person what are the some of the analytics that you watch when it comes to your listings what are you watching and what are you looking to improve? Yeah, so we, a lot of, on the Amazon, we, we keep it separate, Amazon and non-Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So on the Amazon side, we focus a lot on the, you know, our BSR for the categories we compete in. And, and of course, our, our PPC spend. So that's a huge chunk of our spend. And, and we keep, you know, we, we have thousands of campaigns essentially uh, managed through a, through a software that we oversee. Um, but on the Amazon side, that is a lot of what we watch uh, is our ad spend. But of course, we daily, you know, multiple times a day, we do keep track of our, our sales and, and you know, kind of these dashboards that tell you the sales and the refunds and all these kind of things to see if anything is kind of going off, right? Because we can track that hourly. Yeah. Um, outside of Amazon, we track, you know, sales, what what channels the sales are coming from, you know, our inventory levels for, for those um channels and yeah anything that's kind of off the customer service side you know, that sort of stuff what about conversions how your listings are converting we keep track of that more on a monthly basis so like once we review monthly we we keep track and track it against the the historicals um but that's something like uh, as far as the listing wise we we try to keep a, a proactive approach you know take a look at our listings very frequently and just any sort of little thing that we could improve on we'll improve it and then we kind of push those changes across all our channels so that everything's synchronized yeah i had a guest um, previously and she was into brand building she she uh, she found really interesting niche in uh, space she built actually in two years she built a uh, multi-million dollar business selling thank you cards that was it so uh talk about nice margins yeah and then it sold it and sold it uh, and she's now building two other brands again very niche but the point is she said we don't spend a dime on paid campaigns until the listings have been optimized in terms of their conversion rates. And what she was saying was, we, I look at what is the benchmark for the category, for a listing, for an average listing, a performing listing to convert, what kind of conversion rate we should be achieving. And then we look at what we are achieving. And if I'm not above that benchmark, then we don't put any dollars because that's basically wasting money. Uh, you, we look at why it's not converting, whether it's reviews or pictures or the information, you've got to fix that part uh, and achieve that conversion rate before you start spending money. Because when you start bringing paid traffic, your conversion is going to suffer anyway. When the volume goes up, it's going to come, the conversion will go down. Uh, so um, that's something that, that she was saying we just don't do it so they constantly and the other thing that point that she made is is i thought was very smart was she said you need to not only look at your conversion rate but you need to put that in context of what you've done so that this is what the conversion uh, what changed the conversion and this is what it's become so in other words link the events and the numbers together and then work on it in a more deliberate way so that you know what is working, what's not working. So yeah, no, I would say certainly. And, and if if people are actually doing that, uh, you would see great results from that because you know, you're know you actually saying, I'm gonna make these changes and then you're going back 
however much time frame later and saying these are the changes that that change <laughs> made or yeah. these are the results that that change created um now as far as like listing and not uh doing anything with the listing you know until you, you kind of see your conversions for us at least on the amazon side that that's just not an option and that's because you know the honeymoon period as they call it you know you want to launch and make sure that you go right away and, and push uh, especially you know nowadays uh with you know reviews and things like that you want to get to that as fast as possible but you know what while still staying within the rules of course and so like you use like amazon's vine program or you use ppc frankly even if it's at a higher a cost to be able to just get traffic and, and get it going so like right away you should be able to see the conversions you know so even with ppc you're bringing traffic to the listing you can still work on converting better so uh the the quicker that you get traffic to the listing as well the quicker you can work on conversion you know so that's like yeah. the just the, the other side of that but uh, yeah we see it as like you're launching and you know you have a certain amount of period where amazon will kind of like your listing if it's new so you better make an impact by then and we see you know right away when we launch a product there are, you know it's all relative to how the product ultimately matures and does you know on uh, at that point but when we first launch a product even when they have no reviews uh some products will do much better than others with with uh ppc you know so we launched some products and they they are at a reasonable ppc or a cost i should say uh even with no reviews so then we know okay that product is probably going to do pretty well once it actually gets reviews and, and we you know it matures right so there's other products that don't you know they they may not move that much right with no reviews and you know like once you get some reviews you see that it may not move as well there you know and yeah. so uh yeah yeah it's different every product is different so um yeah i mean this is uh it's true i had another guest who actually he was uh, the head of uh, vice president in a in an agency that they, they serviced Amazon sellers, and recently, recently being we are the beginning in, at the beginning of 2022, like February, and attribution is fairly new on Amazon, and apparently Amazon algorithm now favors those who drive external traffic to their listing directly to their listing that's correct and uh, and that also if you are enrolled in this brand referral program they reimburse you their commission 10 percent. Uh, yeah 10 percent. so uh and this gentleman was saying that the algorithm favors it so if you're bringing external traffic you also get organic traffic coming directly to your listing as well as ranking up on the keywords. But when you bring direct traffic, there is no search. There's no nothing. You bring the customer directly on your listing and they're not doing any search. So at that point, they either buy or not. And of course, the conversion means that conversion is much, much higher because there's no looking at stuff. They like it or they don't like it, right? What yeah. do you say to that? Yeah, you know, anytime our approach is like anytime I hear, for example, uh, a theory, because I would call this a theory, no one really knows what the Amazon algorithm is really <laughs> doing. Um, but anytime I hear one of these theories that, that uh, kind of picks up steam and, and I hear it from multiple sources, you know, we really put it to the test just in case, you know, <laughs> so of course, we, we try to send uh, outside traffic, we're, we're enrolled in the in the brand referral program. And it totally makes sense why Amazon would be doing this, right? If you're tracking Amazon's ad business, it's, uh, you know, growing like crazy. And it's, uh, you know, more and more, you know, people say Amazon is kind of like a pay to play uh, type of marketplace. And we see it ourselves, right? Uh, yeah. If you pay for ads, uh, you not only get, you know, sales from ads, but uh, they like you a little more in the search results. You know, it's from, from our experience, what we've seen. So um, it is what it is. Uh, if, clearly, if enough... If they're making that much money, it's because the the ads are working and people are are using them. So yeah, we we're we are with it. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, Robert, tell us about the uh, the makeup of your team uh, in terms of what does it take to be successful 
Uh, but define the roles. What should people be prepared? And if they are already not doing it, they'll probably see the, the impact of it. But what are the roles that you must have to pay attention to that you cannot ignore? And, and what do you outsource? And uh, what do you recommend? Uh, knowing what you know at the beginning and during growth, what makes sense to outsource? What makes sense to keep it in-house? Yeah, and I would say if I'm giving this advice just to whoever is listening, uh, you know, try to outsource whatever you're not good at, right? So uh, I'm not outsourcing like our financial reports, our, you know, kind of uh, our operations, like to begin with, you know, stuff like that, that I, on the tech side, for example, those are things I'm personally involved in and I see end to end or I have at some point seen end to end, right? Until it became a process and, you know, now I oversee it or something. But like, as far as outsourcing, you know, like, uh, graphic designers, you know, we have a couple graphic designers. You always need, you know, to, to kind of uh, keep things fresh, right, within your listings and, and, and within your website and all these sort of things, social media perhaps. Um, then you need almost always somebody in operations who knows just a little bit about everything, about all the channels, about things that can kind of stop the order process or you're on your listing or call Amazon or, you know, something like a, a – uh, a jack of all trades sort of operations person. Um, and for us, we also have a logistics uh, person who, who, or logistics, I should say, a person who actually uh, fulfills orders. So a full-time employee who just fulfills all the orders outside of Amazon um, because we do ship all those, all the other channels. Um, and then somebody on the marketing side who, who plans, you know, maybe social media campaigns or maybe if we want to uh, run any sort of, sort of promotions, um, and uh, on the ad side, I would say it's it's very you know vital if you want to to scale to have somebody overlooking, especially Amazon ads. You know, for us, it's not necessarily someone looking at it as far as much as we have. You know, we have a software. It's it's pretty expensive, but it's worth it. It's kind of like having a couple employees, right? Uh, and the software uh, automatically changes bids and creates new campaigns and and sort of over time optimizes the a cost so that's very important well, you manage because it yourself though you manage we yourself. manage the software right but the software you know based on rules and based on like you know what what we wanted to do you know helps a lot uh, do like the the groundwork you know so to speak okay. and then on the logistics side you you need somebody who is you know on top of your warehousing your inventory your you know your uh, containers coming in your your shipments going to amazon all that sort of stuff. And, and for us, we really have it streamlined by this infrastructure that I was talking to you about. Like, uh, you know, like you mentioned, we know exactly what's on each of our warehouses. And what I mean by warehouses is not just physical warehouses, right? Like uh, the stock that is not at your warehouse and it's not at Amazon, but it's on the way, that's a warehouse in itself, right? Your right, China exactly. factory could be a warehouse. So we have everything exactly mapped. And so we're able to, to say, okay, this is there, this is there. And the system automatically tracks and, and moves the inventory from those uh, warehouses. So we know, you know, we have a real time look at like what's going on uh, in our logistics. And that's very important. So, um, and of course, what I mentioned, I don't outsource, but the finance and the accounting, uh, it's, it's a must. Uh, you need to have numbers. Uh, you need to know how much money and, and profit you're, you're really bringing in and, you know, all, all these sort of reports that you need on finance. Uh, the only thing I do outsource is the the actual, you know, filing of the taxes itself, right? So I, I know finance and accounting, and we we take a look at that every month, every week, et cetera. But at the end of the year, you know, we still do need an accountant and, and to review and then to file our taxes. Sure. So um, to, to, to wrap up, uh, my final question is always uh, the wish list. So if you could wish one thing for Amazon to change, in their policies for sellers, what would that be? I always say uh, to stop uh, the the 1P brands, the, the vendor program. Uh, huh. I'm a big advocate for that. And I think uh, as of recently, maybe there's a state where they just passed uh, some legislation that where they're getting rid of the, the sold by Amazon program or something like that. But I always say that that's my big wish list and it would just make it uh, a lot easier to compete overall in the marketplace. When, when brands are sold by Amazon, not necessarily Amazon's brands, but just brands sold by Amazon, it makes it a lot harder to compete for, for third-party sellers because of the different fees and things that, that those vendors don't face. 
So that that's just always my wish list. But yeah, well, you know, one constant with Amazon is change, right? It's the constant. That's right. <laughs> so you never know what's coming next. So this is great, uh, Robert. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, where do you live, and what are your passions? What uh, what do you like to do outside of work? Yeah, so I'm based uh, suburbs of Atlanta. Uh, originally born in Venezuela, and you know, family moved uh, to the U.S. over 20 years ago. Uh, I'm married uh, and have a, a one-year-old daughter, or coming up on one year old. Uh, that you know, that happens so fast. Uh, but I, I love sports. You know, love spending time with the fam and, and doing some sort of physical activity. And I've always kind of just been an, an entrepreneur. You know, like I started kind of e-commerce back in 2010, just you know, mingling in it, and always been that. Uh, used to sell websites back when I was in high school. Uh, you know, just always kind of tinkering until you know th this kind of venture happened. But uh, yeah, uh, we're here on the East Coast time, Atlanta. I think you know, same as you uh, in New York. Yeah. So yeah so tell us how can people find you yeah so it, directly my email uh r gomez at 4qbrands.com um but of course feel free to to reach out you know contact form on, on our website our brand is uh, cafeproducts.com uh, or amazon.com slash cafe great so we'll post all your contact information on the episode page together with transcription and anything else so um, I'm sure people will reach out to you. And so um, this is very valuable. Thank you for participating. And, uh, you know, it's always great to hear from people who have hands-on knowledge. They can speak from experience rather than in theory. So um, thank you. And uh, this brings us to the end of another episode. And uh, I'll see you all next time. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Be sure and subscribe, rate, and review our show. And be sure and share an episode with a friend. And thank you so much for being with us today. We'll see you next week here on Amazon Legends.